Welcome to The Ownership Economy, the podcast that explores the people and ideas that are utilizing technology, economics, and the law to reimagine how the economy can work for everyone. Here we connect with the entrepreneurs, investors, thought leaders, academics, and politicians that are constructing the ownership economy by expanding access to broad-based ownership and democratic governance. I'm Martin Smith, and I'm joined by my co-host, Jad Mamond. We are two investors and operators that aim to use this platform to showcase the people and the ideas that will shape an economy that offers more economic opportunity for all. Today, we are joined by Pia Mancini, founder and CEO of Open Collective, a platform that enables communities of all kinds to quickly set up a legal entity known as a fiscal host, raise funds, manage funds transparently, pay contributors, and do so in a legally compliant and easy, maintainable way. It's legal and financial infrastructure for communities of any kind, anywhere. She previously co-founded Democracy Earth, a nonprofit focused on building tools and a platform for political groups, which has since become a decentralized tool for borderless democracy. I'm going to hand things over to my co-host, Jahad, who's going to take things from here. Welcome, Pia. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, Pia. Um, Thanks for making the time. Super busy end of the year running, and we very much appreciate your time. So um, let's get straight into it then. So Martin and I, the reason you came up is, you know, uh, as listeners of the pod might know, right, we, in episode one, we had Nathan Schneider on, he's he's a friend of ours, we talked talked a lot about exit to community and these things. And, you know, we we kind of take a look at, uh, we were introduced around August, and you took a look, we're really taking a deep look at exit to community. And then when I just, you know, from getting lost in the Wikipedia rabbit hole, discovered a bunch of other things you got into. So really, your background from our perspective is really just, you know, you're coming at it from the perspective of governance and financial upside and stakeholder incentives, which is fascinating. So what really brought you into all of this? Um, so I guess, you know, if I look back and yes, I've done like a gazillion different things, which I guess most of you are of your uh, guest here would have um, yeah right so but you know at one point you need to start joining the dots um somehow and I guess the what joins the dots for me is um thinking alternative systems um to the type of systems that we have today I am convinced that the type of political institutions and, and economic institutions that we have, we've inherited, and mm. institutions are not created in the void. They respond to a certain society, a certain access to education, a certain technology, and access to that technology. Um, and so we are still, you know, trying to adapt ourselves to live under institutions that were created for a very different society. And so that creates a lot of noise in the system. Um, And I think that we are very much out of sync with those institutions. And so essentially what brought me here um, today is um, how can we design new institutions that are more like the type of society we have today? Because at the end of the day, it's up to us. It's our, it should be our decision, right? Who, how we govern ourselves, how we create and distribute value, um, what we assign value to, how that value is created and, and, and ascribed. So that should be our decision and it should be up to us. So, you know, here we are. Awesome. I mean, I have my own journey to coming around to views like that myself. I, you know, maybe some people would call them weird beliefs or eccentric beliefs, but can you tell us a little bit, you know, you don't, you don't jump in with two feet one day and go, you know what? We need to have a say in the alternative in alternative yeah. institutions that govern our our financial and economic well being, right? It doesn't happen overnight, right? So I know this is yeah. kind of a personal story for you, right? So where where did it become a real like pressing personal problem for you? Yeah, no, that's fair. That's fair. Um, so I was always interested in politics, and I come from politics. I studied political science, and um, I was like my my thesis and undergrad was about institutions and how institutions Mm -hmm. impact society and how institutions do matter because they create a certain type of citizens, right? The rules that we have mold the type of citizens that we have. Um, I always say that apathy in the system is not a bug, it's a feature, right? If you Mm -hmm. have a political system that is 
enclosed and is only concerned um, by the game between professional citizens that we call politicians and everyone else is expected to just go make money in their own private way, of course you're going to have apathy because like, well, you're going to, you, you are called once every two years to say yes or no to a system, but you're never invited to, you know, um, design options. You're never invited to the decision-making process. So, you know, fuck this, right? It's expected yeah. for people to be apathetic. Yep. It's like, it's how the system operates. Anyway, so, um, so that's where I come from. I come from, from politics. I come from, you know, my, my, my families are, you know, quite political family, I guess, like very mm-hmm. much fighting in the morning to see who got the, the paper first, I guess, because <laughs> we had printed press <laughs> when I was growing up. Yeah. And um, um, my, both my parents are very kind of involved and um, informed, you know, and so discussions in my house were like, you know, a daily kind of thing. And so I went into university to study political science because I wanted to, I guess I was very lucky because I was growing mm-hmm. up in a family that could support me and I was like, you know, working for free so I could gain experience and I could choose mm-hmm. where I studied and I went to school. Um, and um, and so I guess I wanted to kind of give something back or figure out how to do this better. And then I worked in politics for years, you know, from campaign management to, I don't know, government, like advisory in, you know, um, the Ministry of um, of Government in the City of Buenos Aires. I did NGOs. I did um, th- political think tanks, uh, public leadership, like mm-hmm. stuff. So I was always in that space. You know, I grew up in in that kind of activist mentality and politics. And then, I I guess. For the democracy, like specifically kind of the democracy, we need to do this better. There has to be a better way of doing this. There Mm -hmm. was a bit of a a moment there when, I don't know, you know, in hindsight, you always have aha moments. And at the time, it's really, you know, you don't realize that they are, but whatever. You know, for me, I think it was a little bit of an aha moment. We were campaigning in, in... um, in the outskirts of Buenos Aires in a district called Pilar. I was uh, trying to get a very good friend of mine, uh, someone I you know admire a lot. I tried, I was trying to get him elected mayor of the district. And um, and one local organizer took us to this kind of we were you know walking the neighborhood, I guess, and uh, we went into this big barn and it was like stuck up to the ceiling with mattresses and construction materials. It was a very poor area. Yeah. And um, so I'm like, great, when are we doing this, right? You know, we're building houses, it's amazing in this area, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, no, 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 but elections are not until next year. And I'm like, oh. wait, what? <laughs> it's like, oh it's goodness. freezing. It's like in the middle of winter. What do you mean we're waiting for another year because like elections are in 2011? This was 2010. And um, and and that was like this is ridiculous. Where we only matter once every two, or three, four years, right? Then when mm-hmm. we don't matter anymore, there has to be a better way. And that's how the whole kind of you know when I joined some friends and we started the Net Party in Argentina and we ran yeah. for elections and all of that jazz. Cool. So I think like that that's a great background for folks to understand. And I think you, I was reading about Net Party uh, Partido de la Red uh back in august and a little bit earlier this week so one of the most interesting things about it is that you know for us we are really interested in this idea of broadening access to governance and like you know like you said if you have if people care only every year two years four years right then nothing really has to happen so one of the most interesting things from when i was reading about net party is that you know, maybe maybe this is where you sort of planted the seeds for Open Collective. You tell me I could be reading into your story a bit too much, but this idea of, hey, we're trying to do this thing and there's all this legal stuff, this legal infrastructure that's in the way of what we're doing, right? And this idea of then just saying, what if we could make that more liquid with technology? Is that kind of where that idea was born first? With yeah, that so definitely the liquid democracy. So Open Collective came a little bit later, um, mm-hmm. but at that time we were definitely struggling with the problem that Open Collective is solving now, which mm-hmm. is 
we couldn't fundraise because the government didn't accept us as a valid legal entity, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, they didn't want us to be a legal entity because they didn't want us to have money, because they didn't want us to run for elections. And so it was like very unfair. <laughs> we're like, why? <laughs> you know, we're trying to, we're asking the status quo for permission to change the status quo. Like it's never yeah. going to happen. Why do we even right. bother, right? And, um, but we tried and then we finally, they took us to court. They took us to the federal like electorate judge. Oh. Uh, yeah, no, it was it was it was fun. it was a fun ride. And um, uh, finally, we got away. And three weeks before elections, we got our party approved, and we fundraised like as much as we could. But we did these crazy things of like crowdfunding your your ballot um, because yeah. Argentina political parties are, are expected to print tens of thousands of ballots because you have individual ballots per party and so yeah. the game here is that it's so expensive that no one can do it right oh that's, i see that's how they stay in power well one of the reasons um and so we did this crowdfunding our first ever crowdfunding campaign in argentina for a political party it was so much fun and everyone is like if you want to vote for this party you have to pay for your own ballot because like if you don't give us money for this we're never gonna be able to do it and so we've got the money to do this. And um, and then, oh my God, when we had to present the numbers to the, you know, auditor, it was yeah. like, at, you know, girl 2022, you know what I mean? Like, this is a donor. At, you know, you're crazy, whatever, dude. Yeah. And the, the auditors were like, what on earth is this? And I was like, well, this is the information we have from the platform. <laughs> Amazing. You know, crowd crowdfunding after that was like um, definitely change um, regulations of crowdfunding change in Argentina after Amazing. that because it was crazy. <laughs> um, cool. So, yeah. Well, I think that's a good space for us to kind of get into Open Collective. So maybe we could start there. You can tell us what for those who don't know, like what is Open Collective and what problem does it solve? Yeah. Um, so Open Collective is an open source kind of. Um, a finance management platform, right? It's an open source accounting platform. Essentially what it does at its core is it lets groups um, fundraise and spend money transparently. And it's paired with a legal entity that receives that money, right? Because the problem that these communities have is that they're forced to become something that they're not in order to access capital. They're forced to, be, to become a legal entity. And many of these communities are decentralized communities around the world. They don't necessarily have a territory because they came together, you know, online, mm -hmm. think open source project or global political movements. And the current system is like, no, you need to have a legal entity somewhere in the world. It has to have like a hierarchical structure because yeah. even if it's not ownership, right, right. you still have a president. Who's or whatever, director, et cetera. Right? It's like asking who's the president of the internet. It's ridiculous, <laughs> right? But we're still trying to feed all of these kind of, you know, society of, of 21st century to institutions of like, you know, previous century. And it mm -hmm. just doesn't work. And so Open Collective sets out to solve that. So we provide a platform to fundraise and spend and manage your money and a place, a pot where to put the money, basically. So it's instant access to having a legal entity anywhere in the world that works for your group. Got it. And so if one, and like you said, there people are being shoehorned into these structures that are basically like, who is your board director? Who is your president? Who, who are the people who have votes and all that? And that doesn't necessarily work. And it causes a bunch of friction for the people who use Open Collective, because now maybe you've got a decentralized community of open source contributors to say, I don't know, uh, Elastic or some other open source platform, right? Yeah. And people are like, um, I just I just contribute code to this thing. I don't want to be the president. Is that kind of what's happening? Exactly, basically? exactly. Got it. And like, why should you, right? Why should we kind of comply to the type of mentality that doesn't exist anymore. Like we read the open source, we share, we contribute to projects and then we stop contributing to projects. Like imagine the transition of someone saying, oh, I am the treasurer or the secretary of the board of this nonprofit we created. But you know what? Now I want to go do something else with my life yeah. because you know what? This is... Yeah. And, and the internet kind of brought about a whole new way of, 
of contributing and collaborating in many different things at the same time. Like we do not live in a world where you work in the same place from cradle to the grave. You don't even vote for the same political party. You don't even belong to a union anymore, right? Yeah. So, but you're. But if you want to have access capital, hang on, you need to be the president or you need to be part of this. Transitions are complicated. You need to be somewhere in the world, in a territory. Mm-hmm. Um, we find that ridiculous. And, and also, in all honesty, unfair, right? Because only those who are able to play that game access massive amount of capital. Mm-hmm. But those who have a ton of impact, they don't. It's mm-hmm. impossible for them. So... Open Collective solves this problem by, by providing like this network of fiscal hosts. So if you're a group anywhere in the world and you want to start raising money, we'll give you the platform to do it and a bank account for your group, essentially, right? A fiscal right. host. And so the fiscal hosts kind of deal with all the legacy operating system, right? They deal with governments and IRS and you know, whatever tax authority. So someone at the end of the line is reporting on that funding. Um, and those are the fiscal hosts. And we kind of abstract out all of that complexity and communities can just raise their money, spend their money on the platform, pay themselves, hire themselves. Um, hosts provide a ton of service, employment services like insurance, uh, we apply for grant. Depending on the host, we provide tax deductible receipts, right? So we have now um, technical writers working for their communities, maintainers working for their communities, volunteers that are getting paid, a ton of groups, like thousands of groups raising money. Um, so in the past 12 months, I think we've unlocked something around $37 million, right? Literally money that moved from the center to the fringes via our yes. collective. Like that's capital that these groups wouldn't have been able to access. And that's a lot of money. It should be like 10 times that, and it will be 10 times that. But, uh, yeah. you know, it's a, it's a great, um, it, I, I think that we want to make sure that folks that are working on, um, for their communities, they can focus on impact. They can yeah. focus on work and not on talking to accountants and lawyers, which is boring and they shouldn't be doing that. Yeah, I have one question on that. So um, how does it, I mean, how does compliance work? Like when I think about a, an organization that's kind of composed of folks from all over the world where um, OC is essentially acting as a, a organizer of those groups and providing the software layer, like how do you deal with things like OFAC and like making sure that the money is going, not, not breaking yeah. kind of international law? Like how does that work? Yeah, so Open Collective is like the the platform, Open Collective Inc., which is the, you need to think of Open Collective as a constellation of different things, right? It's not one thing. Open Collective Inc., which is the company that I I run, and it's a for-profit company, provides the virtual layer, right, where all of this happens, which is the platform itself, right? So we build the software for all of these kind of uh, fundraising, spending, management, connection events, et cetera, takes place. And then you have um, that layer, the digital layer connects fiscal hosts, which are the non-for-profits. And we have a network of 700 non-for-profits around the world, some of which are ours and some that, you know, we just provide services to, connects non-for-profits to the communities. So the non-for-profits are then the ones who do the compliance in their own local um, legislation. So, for example, we have a charity in the US, the Open Collective Foundation. It's a 501c3. So, we provide all the projects under that umbrella with charitable status, with, with um, tax deductible receipts and things like that. Um, that foundation is in charge of doing the compliance for those groups in the US, right? Then there is, for example, Open Collective in the um, UK, right? It's a separate entity with separate people. The Open Collective UK deals with tax reporting, compliance, blah, 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 for all the collectives that it hosts in the UK. And like that, we have groups all over the world. Makes, makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah, so we kind of we leverage these both things like the platform and this network of legal entities, and depends on where you are and how we have entities that are very um, that work on a vertical. For example, the Open Source Collective, which is a league of business that we created in the U.S. that currently hosts three thousand open source projects around the world. 
and provides, you know, enables funding to all of them. Um, that legal entity deals with its own compliance, tax reporting, deals with the donors and all of that, right? So it really, the, the hosts are the ones who manage the complexity of connecting to um, the legacy system. And the platform just enables all of this to happen in a transparent way. Super cool. Martin, do you follow up? Yeah, so I mean, it's just interesting because I think it's far more thought out than a lot of what we see with DAOs, right? We've got a, a, a kind of attorney coming on the podcast next week that does a lot of work around cooperatives and is now doing a lot of work around DAOs. And it, this just seems far more thought out than a lot of kind of the what we've heard from DAOs and, and people going into DAOs and not really understanding that they're yeah. partners and and... And so. Yeah, so a while back I was talking to that, like we've been around for many years, right? So we, we, the DAO kind of that space that now is growing so much, we've been talking to them for like six years, right? Um, and I recently talked with one of the Aragon um, founders. And, oh, nice. and he, yeah, he was telling me like, look, Pia, when, when you started, well, we started at the same time when we started, you were all about like, you know, government and that you needed to file taxes and things like that. I just couldn't understand why. And now I get it. Right now we have like, I understand why you still need to interface with that. And so we are talking to several kind of DAOs about, you know, wait, at the end of the day, like we need a base tab. You know, we need to be able to prove our landlord that we are employed and a DAO is not mm -hmm. giving you that. So they're turning to Open Collective and they're like, can we figure something out? And I think, mm -hmm. yes, I think that Open Collective has been really good at being this interface between like a decentralized space that still connects to the legacy system that still thinks in fias. Um, we haven't been very good at connecting with like the, you know, DAO space so far, but the DAOs have been very good at connecting with the, you know, highly decentralized way of sharing value but now they realize they also need a point of connection with the real world, right? Mm -hmm. With the kind of legacy system or the fiat world, some point of connection, right? We still need. And so I'm trying to help them think, how can we support them and provide them with, you know, the, yes, with the tools they need to have something that resembles to some form that they're going to have to present in their own local, to their own local governments. Got it. And so like this, are you just are you actually just dig right into the DAO structure? Actually, you can jump out of that part. So on the DAO side, you know, I, I noticed some of your thoughts in, in some of these blog posts you've been recently writing. Um, but it's clear that from the outside, to me at least, it's pretty clear that you folks are really focused on the legal and social organizational layer. Like I can tell there's been a lot of thought put into that. Like, um, how do we relate to each other? How do we work on this project? What are our community principles? How, what things are we not going to act, absolutely not violate, right? And then what are things that we're willing to sort of, you know, disagree and move forward on? So you, you know, like you said, you've been in this thing for six, seven years. It's been, a, it's been a while, at least this way of working. What do you think what some lessons that DAOs and Web3 folks can learn from your experience with OC? Um, yeah, I think... Um... So we open collective is really bad at governance. It's like notorious. We are very bad at two things, like notoriously communicating and governance. Like we are just bad. I just hired the first marketing person for the first time in six years. We just we've never spent one dollar in advertising. We yeah. just yeah, you know, we, we everything has been very organic. But I think at mm -hmm. this stage of the company and the project, we actually need to start kind of you know being more adults. Um. And so, and the other thing that we're notoriously bad at is governance. And so I think that, so, you know, what we want to learn first from DAOs or, or how we want to, you know, connect there has to do with, with governance and decision-making. Um, Open Collective still has for all our, like, you know, flat circle kind of structure, mm -hmm. we are still organized around admins, right? Collectives mm -hmm. have admins. And so there's like this, this is like the vein of my existence, you know, seriously, for me, having this power dynamic inside of my platform where you have an admin that has admin rights and others who don't, and they can invite other admins, like just, it's a thorn on my side. But right now, we still, we've not, we haven't focused on that. And mm -hmm. 
you know, it was useful. It was good enough to get us here. But I want to change that because I think that I don't want to, I, I do not want to fix a power structures inside of, of this type of power dynamics. Um, so I want to learn about, um, and we're doing projects with MetaGov, for example, with Nathan mm. and other folks that they're like plugging into open collective um, decision-making tooling um, elsewhere. The other thing is I was always very, um, um, I, I was always convinced that we don't need to do everything. Like I don't yeah. think in like we need to own the supply chain kind of mode. Like I am yeah. just not like that. We do one thing really well, and then the rest of the world can help us with the things that we don't do very well. Yeah. And I don't. We don't need to own the whole thing. So I prefer to think of Open Collective as infrastructure that can you know you can plug different things. And so mm -hmm. MetaGov is one, and then DAOs can be other. You know, like another path, a different yeah. path. Or anyway, so that's on what we can learn. Um, and then what I think um, DAOs could learn from Open Collective, I guess, it's what I was saying before, like at the end of the road, like there has to be a connection point with the, you know, fiat world. And yeah. because we are still embedded in this world. And, you know, when you transition, like if you, you know, in systems thinking, when you transition systems, it's never a clear cut. Both systems will need to overlap. Right, you have a decaying system and, and, and then a system that is arising, but there's a mm. ton of overlap. They like feed off each other, they change each other, you know. And so there has to be an interface. They need to, you know, I guess also consider how this is gonna uh, interface. Um that's the one thing I would say. And then and also I guess the one of the things that makes me more nervous about yeah. DAOs um, has to do with the, you know, and there's a project that is trying to solve this and we can talk about this later, but it's like this, this lack of humanity in a way, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. like yes. an address is not a human, right? Yeah. It's an address. Yeah. And so civil attacks are by no means unsolved as much as, you know, you know, so many you know, intelligent folks are working on like trying to solve for civil attacks. It's still not. Yeah, can you just explain? Uh, oh, yes, of course. Sorry. Civil attack, yeah. yeah. So so essentially a civil attack is when someone controls many different addresses, right? Mm -hmm. And they 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 can seem like they are multiple people, but they're not. They're just one person controlling very um different addresses, for example. And so we suffered so just, from. So just, so just let me follow up on that real quick because I think that that is going to throw some some folks, some listeners off. So, okay. so the, the the challenge there is that if I control many addresses and I have an open governance layer, I can essentially take over the governance of one of these one of these collectives. That's that's effectively the the issue, right? Yeah, and so when you have democratic systems, you need to ensure that you have people and not bots behind yeah. your voting, you know, personas, essentially. And it's very difficult. It's all, today it's impossible um, still to um, solve that in the DAO space or in the crypto space. Yeah, um, yeah, there's um, one thing that you reminded me of, actually, is you know, Gitcoin DAO is, that's like one of their biggest things, right? <laughs> like, and I, and seen, you know, also, like, but every quarter over quarter, there's an entire squad, all kinds of funds dedicated to, we need to solve civil attacks if we actually want to scale our and yeah. DAOs and, Git, yeah, and Gitcoin is you know, one of the better known ones. But in the last year, there are, I think there's something like 2,300 DAOs on Ethereum alone, something like that. So, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah it's only going so, to get worse. It's only going to get worse, right? And so when you're thinking of democratic institutions or like democratic processes, not being mm -hmm. able to discern if someone is controlling many different like voting um, personas, it's a, it's a big problem. Um, so, uh, you know, full disclosure, my husband is working on, on this, but um, mm -hmm. he um, started this um, protocol called Proof of Humanity that essentially mm -hmm. tries to solve for this by um, validating humans on the blockchain, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so the way they do it is with um, a mechanism where it has like social validation, right? So you upload your profile, which is a video, someone else from the network mm -hmm. is Vouch, then you have a period when people can challenge 
and then you mm-hmm. start accruing universal basic income tokens once you are approved. Um, and so anyway, I, I think that is still a big problem and that for, for you know, it has, I'm glad we're going through all of this level of experimentation, but I think that we, we still need to solve for the identity piece if we want mm-hmm. this to scale. Um, the other thing I would say that I think it's interesting is for um, um, for all like open collective tries to be accessible, we are not, and we are mm-hmm. like probably one of the most accessible platform or most accessibility conscious platforms out there. We are not, right? Like it's yeah. difficult for. We are very big in the kind of solidarity economy, so think bail funds, giving circles, yeah, mutual aid, aid yes. Right, so that is, and for folks to use the open collective platform, many times it's an uphill kind of you know mm-hmm. road, and the learning curve, and it's not we we try to keep like low tech, you know, or tech to the minimal. Those are like all the way <laughs> on the other end, like Absolutely. you know. Sure. When I'm thinking about E2C, one of the things that's stopping me or or that it's like a negative point, you know, yeah. we're doing all of this analysis, but for DAOs, it's like, how on earth I'm going to get a MetaMask address on like, you know, in the computer of all of these folks? It's just not going to yeah. happen. The onboarding yeah, yeah, yeah. is still not there. So I think we should, like, the you know, as a community, Web3 should, like, should really invest time in, like, lowering tech um, for yeah. folks otherwise it's yeah. not it's just not gonna run yeah obviously that's a very good point because like people talk about user experience of web3 a lot and a lot of people forget that accessibility is user experience right like that like and not just things like oh do i understand what a metamask thing is but basically how how are the various if you're open collective for instance you know there are probably a lot of things around the solidarity economy things for disabled folks and all that yeah. How are these folks going to actually access a wallet? What does it sound like when a screen reader reads off a, a 25 character hash or something? Yeah, right? oh, like, no, it's impossible. Like, like yeah. we have issues with, you know, we are we are doing a lot of cash grants to folks in, in need in the US and mm-hmm. they are asking us to pay the landlords directly, right? Because they're about mm-hmm. to get evicted. And you have no idea how difficult it is to get like money to the landlords. It's like, it's really, you know, there's no PayPal account. There's like, we don't do checks. There is like, no. And so it's to that kind of level. And and for someone, it's like, they might lose their house. Do you know what I mean? Or they must get yeah. kicked out of their flat. And so I think the disconnect still, it's big. And I understand that this is like a picture and we should see the movie. I, I, I absolutely believe that this is, evolving and it's going to change and Mm -hmm. technology is going to like get more mature and onboarding ramps and blah 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 but i think we should be paying more attention to it to be honest yeah and one way even to sum it up from my perspective from what i've seen uh, another way of saying what you said is basically uh user experience is not only a crypto on-ramp basically there are all kinds of things upstream and downstream that have to be thought through for sure um and so then coming back around almost to what was uh what, what's going on with open collective now i think you know, like you said y'all have y'all have been growing the last few years you're now profitable um one of the you know thing that's really interesting for us why i'm really interested in open collective is that you in a lot of ways like the folks that we talk with on this podcast is you've kind of created a real visible legible market around a lot of shadow economy stuff right mm-hmm. like pe- peeps were we were never going to scale beyond five or 10 people. Now you've given them the, the ability to maybe scale to 20 or 50 and then also really ramp up their operations. Um, and so when I, when I think about that, you know, this caught my eye with social media analysis toolkit, just in full, um, full disclosure, I became an OPC user because a friend of mine is running an open source project and was like, Hey, yeah, contribute to our open collective. And what I, what really caught my eye, the second I entered through that on ramp was that y'all were, working on exit to community. So maybe this is a good time for us to then transition into, uh, you could maybe tell us what exit to community means for you. Cause we can, we'll point to exit to community in the show notes, but I'm interested just because this is such a fluid concept still, right? So I'm interested to hear how you're thinking of E2C. Yeah. Um, in, okay, so we are Open Collective Inc. The platform is mm-hmm. a venture backed um, stuff traditional startup, like mm-hmm. the whole the whole stack, right? 
a C Corp from Delaware, SBB Bank, Silicon Legal, like you know, the whole thing. Yeah. And um and we but we were always kind of really weird. Um, we took 10-year vesting, you know, on our on our for founders because mm-hmm. like we sat down with with our you know potential investors and we were like, look, this is for us, this is long term. We are taking 10-year vesting. So you know, if you're prepared to, you know, you know, write this with us, great. But th- this is how we're thinking about it, right? We're not gonna sleep nice. and sell the company in four years or anything like that. Um, so we were very clear about that. But we we didn't have at the time a useful tool to um, fundraise or get the capital we needed that wasn't investing, that wasn't VC, the venture capital. Mm-hmm. Like we just didn't, we needed to support our families, like, you know, two of the three co-founders, um, we had kids. And, and so it's like, you know, I can't just do this on my, as a side hustle because it's mm-hmm. not going to work. Um, and so we ended up taking money, but we were very lucky because my co-founder, Xavier, he had a very bad experience in the past with a company called Storyfy that he sold. Mm-hmm. Um, and he had a very, very bad experience with ABC that I was just, you know, they, I don't know, it, it, was, it was bad. So he was quite adamant that he was not going to be giving them a single inch. Like he almost preferred to fold open collective than like, you know, and he was a very nice. strong, very, very, very strong negotiator. And we were also very lucky because we had competing term sheets. And uh, one of those term sheets, it was like, um, they didn't want anything. They were like, yeah, here's a million dollars to whatever we want. We don't need board seats. Like, we just, you know, we just want to give you the money and, you know, whatever. Don't call us once every every now and then. And we're like, okay. And then we had Bloomberg by down the other side with a competing term sheet. And so we're like, look, you know, we want to have funding from Bloomberg Beta because your investment thesis is aligned with us. It's about the future of work. You're, you know, investing Mm -hmm. in all of these companies very long term because you have one LP, right? Um, And so, but we have this other term sheet and it's giving us everything we want and we're going to go with them. And so we were very, very lucky. And so we ended up not having to give any board seats. So the board is still like Xavier and myself. We hold majority of the company. Um, they don't have voting rights. Like, you know, and I need, I know <clears throat> that I'm never going to get those terms again, right? So I was always yeah. very um, conscious of our spending. I wanted to get to sustainability because mm-hmm. I wanted my options open. And, and we're here, right? So now we are, we are profitable, you know, we're, we're in the green. We're not like throwing money to the sky, but you know, we are profitable. Mm-hmm. And um, <clears throat> now I'm thinking, okay, what happens, you know, with Open Collective in the future? Like, where do we want to go? And that's when we start thinking about it to see because the traditional exits for a startup like ours is you either sell your company to, you know, Microsoft, or you um, you go public. Or you have like this lifestyle kind of business, but it's very dependent on the funders, right? And I didn't want that. I didn't want, I I work very hard, very, very hard to make myself redundant every day. Like I want Open Collective to like not need me anymore. Like that's my goal because I want to create like an independent company. So we've been doing a lot of progress towards that. And so, um, so E2C seems to us like the natural space for Open Collective to get into. <clears throat> E2C means we want to find in the community the liquidity to pay our, back our investors because we want them to invest in other companies like OC mm-hmm. um, and also pay back founders because we need to de-risk, obviously, mm-hmm. and our employees. And we want more than anything ownership in the hands of the community. So we need to figure out a legal structure, corporate structure and governance structure that allows us to do this. And we're thinking of Open Collective in like four four different kind of lenses here or Mm -hmm. four things that we are looking for that we need in this structure, in future structure. We want multi-stakeholder governance because we are a complex bunch of people, organizations, collectives, individuals, donors, 
and we want that kind of diversity and multi-stakeholder to be represented. Um, we need liquidity because we need to pay our investors and, and, and mm-hmm. founders and employees, and we need to we can't you know uh, risk the company by using all the free cash flow, free cash flow. Uh, we um, so multi-stakeholder governance, liquidity, um, vision. We need to make sure that and this is a very important one because today the structure that we have with fiscal hosts and mm-hmm. open collective being this like digital layer, it's what works today for yeah. communities to be sustainable. By no means we think that it's going to work in like 10, 15 years. Like that's not what we think, right? Yeah. So we want to find a structure that enables the vision to keep making progress and to keep serving the communities. We do not want to lock collectives into an existing solution because this solution is for today. So we need to find a structure that is flexible enough to be resilient and change with times. Right? Mm-hmm. And the last and the last piece is purpose. We want to lock in the purpose of open collective into the corporate structure. Um, and we are on the hunt for uh, something that more or less works, <laughs> right? Which um, there is, this is uncharted waters, and there's like no no clear examples or roadmap um, for how you know and how do we do this? How on earth do we make this happen? But the ultimate goal is for the community to own Open Collective and to enter into you know some sort of like governance agreement and then a shared revenue agreement. So Pia, just on that point, right? So I think this is like one thing that we think about a lot, um, just in terms of kind of the role of the founder, right? So your software layer is effectively helping to build communities that are fairly decentralized. Um, And one of the common themes today is this kind of decentralizing the ownership um, to the community, primarily through tokens um, or kind of the blockchain and tokens built on top of coins have allowed for decentralization, right? But one of the things that you've brought up is how important it was to get to profitability with two founders that own the majority of the cap table. So can you kind of talk through that tension and how you've thought about it as an entrepreneur and why it was so important for you to get to a certain stage before you even start thinking about multi-stakeholder governance or... or Yeah, I guess it was like, I mean, I'm... I am very, you know, it's not like we didn't try before <laughs> because we tried in 2018, we tried to go to our investors and we're like, oh, we want to build this thing. It's a steward owned company. We want to get like, and they're like, are you making money? No. <laughs> and they're like, yes, come back when you do. I'm like, should they're right. We should, you know, I think it was important. Like, we tried, but we were, you know, eager, I guess. But um. I think they were right in telling us, like, look, focus on 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 your growth, and then come back to us when when you know you're making money, because I think that sometimes like you end up putting the you know the cart in front of the horse, right? You don't even know if you have a, a business, and you are, and then the governance structure is so it's like an energy drain, like it's not easy, and you end up discussing and talking about. It's like form and content, right? You end up talking more about the form and forgetting about the content. So for us, like we wanted to make sure that this was a business that made sense because we believe in businesses also. We believe in impact businesses. We believe in projects that are generating money, right? And not, you know, otherwise we would have done a non-for-profit, which I don't think we would be have been able to do what we did with a non-for-profit, but that's a different story. But we we... We want more open collectives in the world, and um, and for that we needed to succeed, right? We needed to show that this there was a business here, and it's fine, and it's great that it's a business, and we will invest in the company and all of that jazz. Um, but the problem is that where where sometimes a lot of you know companies get stuck, or where we w- don't want to get stuck is when when this gets very funder centric, right? Because I believe that a successful business is one where its mission survives its founders. And it's very difficult today with the options that you have on the table to to have 
to, you know, to have good founder succession, right? It's difficult. It's very difficult. It's very traumatic normally because most of these companies are very founder-centric. Um, and so Xavier, my co-founder, left earlier in the year, for example. He stopped his vesting and he's like, he's actually working in the DAO space. He's like, you know, this is, this is amazing, but I need to do something else and I want to, you know, explore and I'm like, okay, great, bye, you know? And I think that we built a company where that didn't break us. And I, mean, you know, I think that is very important. So what, what would you say to kind of the founders that are looking today to decentralize rapidly in order to achieve some sort of network effect or moat, um, you know, with a Web3 venture? Like, do you think that's a risk? Do you think that that's a, like, what do you think that tension is? Or, or how do you... What would be your advice for those founders that are like, oh, you know, I can tokenize my company quickly. I can kind of get to scale, but then they're at this diluted position and they, you know, you don't have this kind of firm center um, around kind of the things that you talk about, which are, you know, getting the vision right and getting the purpose right before you start thinking about multi-stakeholder governance and liquidity. Yeah, definitely getting the, the vision and the purpose is important and it requires like, certainly it requires leadership and you need to, I don't know, maybe because this is just how I'm wired, but I want to have options on the table. So we were very, very clear. And we had a very slow growth in a way. And I decided not, and we we have a ton of money. I always had a one and a half year, like 18 month um, runway in the bank, right? Because the people are I hire, they're all parents and they have families. And I wanted to make sure that we could, if something wasn't working, I had enough money in the bank to turn this around. But it's not just about money to turn something around. It's also about the power to do it. We, we don't want to grow for, grow for growth's sake. We don't want to grow for growth's sake, right? And the risk that you have when you need to build network effects because you need to grow your community because you need your token to succeed is that you, growth is what you optimize for, right? Always. And optimizing for growth comes at a huge cost, especially early on. Because early on, you just need to make something people want, right? And if it's like 10 people who want it and love it, those like that, that is a win. You know, if you have 100 people who use your, whatever you are creating, your product and just love it, that is a win. And going too fast to, I'm just going to decentralize and, and because I want like this massive network for the network's sake, I think it's a huge risk. And I think that you end up in a position where, yes, you you don't have control. It's very difficult to, it's so hard to do governance. Like I think, I think maybe people underestimate how difficult it is to do governance. Mm -hmm. um, and so you need a, I don't know, I, I think, and, and maybe this is not the same for everyone, but I, I prefer to have like a rock solid foundation and grow from there. And it's like the Open Collective team, they work like crazy because they are believe in the mission that we have. And it's hard to do that with like, you know, big network that you're acquiring. It's tempting because the crypto treasuries have more money than God. And, you know, if you want liquidity, <laughs> yeah, there it is. But um, do you have a product people love? Do you have something that you're making a change in this world? Do you have people that are going to follow you? We were talking yesterday with my team and like they already use our community, put, you know, put up um, with so much like ugly open collective, like tech stuff, you know, for us. The, it was so ugly, the platform. It worked so badly for such a long time. And users are here and they kept using it. And we have like super low churn. And I, honestly, I'm amazed that they're, they're still with us because some things we haven't fixed in years. And, um, but, you know, they, we are obviously doing something that they need and that it's important for them and that it solves a problem. So I would say until you find product market fit in a way that your community is like, you know, raves about you. I wouldn't, I wouldn't think about um, transitioning out to like a decentralized um, multi-stakeholder governance system. Yeah. I mean, you make this comment around kind of like the, the community is kind of fickle in these decentralized systems and you have a very powerful kind of aligned community. And it seems like in the micro 
environment or in the firm level environment, we've created some of the problems of fast money in developing markets in the macro environment. And so you have the same kind of tension of money flowing in and out. I mean, there was this problem in Argentina like 20 years ago and 10 years ago, right? And now we've essentially created that same environment for early stage startups where you're not just focused on you know, the day-to-day and getting the product market fit and driving customer kind of acquisition and and, and uh, retention, but you're also kind of looking at that volatility of your token price and worrying I about, kind of, I mean- It's like a level of complexity that like, why would you do that to yourself? <laughs> like, yeah. You know, it's like mad. Um, I think, yeah. look, I think that some projects should just be DAOs and are born like DAOs and that makes a lot of sense. Like, you know, Uniswap, of course, you know, what are you gonna, but, um, but depends on what you're building, I guess. Mm-hmm. Is the answer. It, do you really need that network, or are you just want the network for net? And how ex- how much are you willing to pay for that network? How much are you yeah. willing to give up in order to acquire that mode? And is that mode gonna is even there? Is is the mode even there? Yeah. Right? Once you have acquired it. Right. Well, that's like one of the really interesting ideas in the space too. Is you see a lot of the the more progressive folks who at least have a little bit of experience thinking through these consensus methods. I've kind of been saying, you know, I actually kind of want to riff on this with you since you mentioned it. Um, there is a project called OneHive that is, works with Token Engineering Commons, Common Stack, and they're very informed by like uh, Eleanor Ostrom's principles yeah. around the commons, right? And so one of the really interesting things they published, which we'll put in the show notes, by the way, for everyone listening, is um, DAOs and the pitfalls of, of progressive decentralization. So basically... You're seeing a lot of folks who come out now and they say, hey, we need a really strong founder vision company or a benevolent dictator model. Then we find product market fit. Then we progressively decentralize. And that's kind of becoming a framework that folks like Andrew Horowitz are trying to put out there. But um, in this article, it's really interesting. They kind of turned on its head and they say, actually, you should consider your community as customer and co-designer. And you need a fiercely loyal community first then sufficient decentralization to that community, and then what we would call product market fit, which is, I think, you know, I may not, I don't necessarily agree with all of them, but I think it's actually a very interesting way to put it. So what do you think about that? Yeah, I think it's super interesting. Um, I think that co-creation with your community is key. And E2C, like that's what we're doing with the whole learning in public and involving the community in designing this with us. Um, I think that there's something very genuine about doing that. It feels right. It feels like it's very interesting, actually. I hadn't thought about it in that way, but a little bit of what's happening with E2C is like, okay, we got here and now we're bringing all the community in with this like learning in public kind of process that we're doing. And then we are kind of, you know, thinking together through this. And then at the other end, like your community is already part of it because, you know, there's something very genuine about walking the talk, you know? You want to involve your community, you want multi-stakeholder governance, but you want to have everything like ready for you on a, on a silver platter. That's not how it works, right? Because yep. you're going to arrive at the end of the line and you're like, okay, we're done. This is now what you need to do. That's not how you do things, right? You need to yeah. involve them first. So I think there is a very clever um, roadmap, especially um, because I, I think that the power of a small group of early adopt strong early adopters is normally like underrated and it's mm-hmm. very powerful it's very very powerful got it and i think like one of the one of the interesting things that you were you touched on there is that you know if you go back to the i see this because i'm involved in a lot of DAOs. i'm a steward of prime DAO. i'm involved in a couple others and really um it's almost as if folks in their governance structures just say, well, we'll do democracy because it's better than having a hierarchy of, you know, people that tell you what to do. And it's almost as if it's like some kind of, you know, panacea that people are like, once we apply democracy, it'll solve how we do this. Right. So I think on your side, what I've seen is you folks have put in a, a lot of really thoughtful work over the last five to six years to say, actually, the vision is this, who's on board with this vision? How do we really begin to unfold this to the community? And so now that we turn back around to that community, right? Your community is not like every community. You can look at it from the outside and say, oh, that's that's the open collective community. But you break it down and there's, like you said, investors, there's open source contributors, there's actually mutual aid societies, people who don't would never ever talk about technology or being interweaved in those circles, right? So I guess the first thing I'd say is now that you're this far along with the vision for E2C, what has been the reception so far from the various multi-stakeholders of your community? Um, so it's been 
<clears throat> surprisingly good, I have to say. I was I was ready to so I wanted to go slow, like slower with this. I was like, we're gonna start this thinking process, I'm gonna start talking to people, we're gonna put something out, but it just took a life of its own. And it seems, it seems to me like intuitively, it seems to me like it's an idea whose time has arrived and it's out of my hands. And I'm very happy with that, terrified, absolutely terrified. But I am very happy with that because I think we're doing the right thing. Um, and so I was, I was ready to start very slowly and then it's taking like a whole speed that I am not provoking it. And so it makes me feel like we are at the right time, right? Because I'm not pushing. And the other day I was reading like about this person who worked with Jeff Bezos. I can't even remember, but he, you know, he they said that Bezos wanted to hire people um, in his team that he had to rein in instead of push, right? Mm-hmm. And it feels to me, and I, that made so much sense to me. I'm like, of course, you just want people to just run very fast. And instead of you mm-hmm. being pushing and inspiring and you just... You know, you're always inspiring, but like, you know, um, pushing for things to happen, you're like trying to control when people just move too fast. Anyway, and so I, that's what I feel with E2C. That's mm-hmm. literally what I feel like I, I felt I'm going to have to push this because folks are not going to, you know, be so receptive to E2C. I'm going to have to do some explaining. So we're going to put this little blog post out. And then suddenly it's like, 500 different emails, all of these groups, all of these people that want to join interview, they have ideas, you know, we just got published in like um, um, a journal about this, which I wasn't yeah. expecting. So um, so I'm, I'm, I'm in the position now to say like, okay, hold your horses, everyone, like let's, you know, make sure that we're thinking this through. And, and it's a great, the great, posi- you know, it's a great position to be in. And so... The reception has been really good. Investors who I was like terrified to talk to um, because I'm not from, you know, it's like not my favorite thing in the world, but yeah. they've been like so, so supportive of this, you know, and they, they were also like, again, quite um, thoughtful in, hey, we are really glad you're making money. Trust us. but We like that. But you should also focus on growth and not just on E to C. You know, you need to consolidate yeah. this because of that. And it makes sense. You know, it made sense to me again that while we run this E to C thought process and we start like creating the building blocks, we don't lose focus on what we're here to do. That is yeah. to grow our mission, right? Um, so yeah, I'm. I was, I was, yeah, I was very, you know, I was surprised and, and uh, I'm very happy with how this process is going. I honestly have more questions than answers, more questions than answers. I don't know where this is going to land or how it's yeah. going to articulate. Um, but I started this process like earlier in the year saying like, what do I need to do today to be able mm-hmm. to do this in two years? Right. And I think that the timeline has accelerated. Substantially. Nice. Yeah. I say nice only because I am super interested in the outcome. So when it happens sooner, I'm like, oh, great. We learned so much. I'm holding on to your life. I have to be honest. Uh, well, I, so I think, you know, me, I'm a, I'm the VP of Product at Zabby Cooperative, right? So the platform cooperative. And so we have kind of a multi-stakeholder um, ownership structure as well. And I'm curious, you know, you mentioned investors. How about um the company employees maybe even some of the major folks that you're engaging with in your community fiscal hosts how has that reception been like what are, what, what are their thoughts yeah so employees are like super behind this like they were the first you know they they were in in this discussion since that you know the beginning of the year so um they 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 want to do this um and they believe in 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 this path for open collective um community um you know, the collectives, I guess, we have so many different collectives that it's hard to kind of pinpoint, but um, mm-hmm. some of them, uh, I would say the more tech collectives or open source collectives um, are starting to push more or comment or surface interest in DAOs. Um, solidarity economy collectives are like lobbying quite strongly for some sort of co-op kind of, you know, Mm -hmm. um, entity. Mm -hmm. Um, So what what comes now, it's 
you know, it's, it's a process that where we need to start bringing in all of these ideas and it's going to be like a, a very open thinking process. Um, and, you know, we need to be careful because at, at, we, we want to arrive somewhere and with open, you know, very, um, very open uh, deliberation process, processes sometimes it's very hard to arrive somewhere so mm-hmm. we I want to do this in a very mindful way that we want to learn and co-create with our community but I also know that at the end of the process I want to be landing somewhere where I can actually push the pattern on this so that my role now is like I don't know like you know orchestrating this in a way that yeah. lands where we somewhere essentially at it. And I think that's very interesting because I think what I'm seeing on the inside of DAOs a lot is, like I said earlier, people are like, well, let's just vote on that. Let's just vote on this. And no, no one really re- recognizes how exhausting that is. And okay. nor do they realize that it's you actually have to be one step upstream of it and you have to be shaping what the options even are mm-hmm. or that asking the questions that determine what ends up yeah. on the governance ballot, yeah. whether it's uh, you know, on shape, or whether you're you're voting on something, voting on something online and through, through your wallet, or through just a Slack poll going, yes, I check mark yeah. that, right? Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I think that maybe this is where my experience in politics, you know, comes in rather handy because I've mm-hmm. been through many processes like this, and like they break you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's very difficult to do this, and you know citizenship and doing democracy it's freaking hard and so um i guess i am very mindful of the process because of all the kind of experience i've had in the past like doing you know public deliberation processes in in politics yeah i think that's one of the interesting things about the at least the the dao structures and honestly i think it's everyone but i find co-op people are way more into this and they're way more experiences they come from that world it's this uh, experience around consensus methods that activists often have been, you know, kind of put in where they understand that, you know, if you're actually beginning to solicit a process like this, you have to reach out to the folks who will not be speaking in that room for a number of reasons, who but will speak this way to you in private and might have really good ideas. So as you're kind of thinking about this is honestly, it's beyond my scope. And I think about the this is like cat herding to the hundredth power <laughs> in the way yeah, that I think about sure. it. So like <laughs> So what, maybe you could get a little bit into the, like, for, what is the process? Now you're saying it's going to be a shorter time line, right? Maybe compared to what you're doing. What's next for you when you sit, when you sit down every day and say, I want to get there in a year. Like what, yeah. how do you actually, what is the, what does that look like for you? Maybe in the next month, maybe that's about as far as you can look. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what I'm trying to figure out now mm-hmm. is, so it's, it's on the one hand is the, learning in public process that I'm going to keep doing. We're going to have mm-hmm. this like long conversation series um, uh, in uh, interviews that I'm going to be doing to folks like that are live with like town hall style um, with our community. So we're going to be interviewing like Nathan or, you know, different folks in the, in the space and also collectives. Right. Um, so that's starting. And, um, and what I'm doing is I'm figuring out the math of all of this because I don't know it. It's not in my skill set. Like I need help essentially figuring out the financial. This is how much money you need. This is what you can offer your investors. This is your, you know, the evaluation of the companies at this. Um, this is a revenue share agreement that you can actually live with and that you're not going to kill your company for it, right? Mm-hmm. I need help with that. And so that's my next steps for me are figuring out the math behind this like how much money do i need to make this work yeah that's awesome because i think like you said earlier you know this there's this is oh sorry go ahead no no sorry (laughs) sorry. Uh, uh with with the traditional board and executive management like this stuff is pretty straightforward right it's like we're looking for this return will the people who are who have you know in a different world javier gave up board seats and those people go yes they look good or they don't right so i think this is definitely you're, you're playing the game on 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 very hard mode but it's going to end up at a cool place definitely i'm super yeah. interested in seeing where it goes uh i guess basically to uh, we're getting near the end of our time here, but you know, maybe we can wrap this up by saying, you know, 
I'm not going to make it specific to Web3 or DAOs, but let's just think about you know folks who are really trying to give ownership to their communities, give them incentives and stakes, and they're at a at a place maybe that you were at a couple of years ago, or maybe just starting. And take a minute too. You don't have by no means do you have to respond immediately. But what would you say are like one to three real takeaways you'd want these founders to take? <laughs> for founders who are looking to do something like this, yeah, for founders who are. Not necessarily to see just founders who are looking to do community ownership, to extend go- governance and ownership to their communities. What would you think are, you know, you standing here after the last 10 years of experience, what are some takeaways you think you could give them? Um, so I think um, the first thing I would say is do it early. And this is where Open Collective didn't do it early. And um because essentially what you want is people to be ready um, to govern. And it's not something that you can get overnight, right? So you, we need to um, practice, get the kind of the, the, the gymnastics of uh, govern, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> of, um, of doing governance. And, and so the earlier you do it in some way or another, um, I think it's uh, the better at the end of the road. Um, that that's one. So the second thing I would say is um, be very be very aligned with your values. Have values, which is not something old startups think of, but have your values. Like have a seat with your team and figure out like what values represent you. And then once you have your values written down, think about what you want to do in terms of governance um, and do it according to those values because there's nothing that is going to hurt your company and uh, <clears throat> progress towards this as doing something that is not aligned with your values. People see that coming from a mile away, a mile yeah. away. <laughs> and and you want community buy-in and you want to involve them and you want them to be part and they're going to they're gonna see this coming if you... If you are doing something that is not genuine and that is not aligned with your values, um, and sometimes it's, this happens not because you're evil, but because you don't have your values written down, right? Mm-hmm. Because you don't have mm-hmm. that at the center of who you are. Um, so that's the second one, and then the third one. It might be simpler than you think, mm. right? Yeah, because I think that sometimes we get wrapped up in like fancy structures and fancy ideas and um and this is maybe going back to the you know dull you know yeah um, argument and it might be as simple as you know a co-op you know it might be as simple as a very you know easy structure or path Mm -hmm. so i guess don't fall in love with like buzzwords and don't get bogged down in like or you know yeah don't don't feel like for this to be a good thing or it has to be complicated and fancy yeah you know, sometimes we forget about that that's a really good point i also really love the point you made about you know getting used to this gymnastic about governance because i think that like you said <laughs> people don't really realize that if you don't want a boss and you don't want a number of people telling you what to do, it means that all of us now have those responsibilities and we have to elevate our game to that. Right. And so I, I think that's a hundred percent spot on. And, you know, from my perspective, I hope anyone listening to this, and if you're a founder and you're doing it, that's maybe even number one for me. It's like, do the, do it earlier than you think, give your yeah. people that confidence and ability from day one, if you can. Yeah. Because awesome. they need to leave, like we learn by experience. You know, we won't know until we do it. So we need to practice. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Pia, thank you so much for your time. This has been a, a joy. And I'm super, super interested to see where you take this. And uh, we, we'll, we'll definitely keep in touch and keep an eye on how it goes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both. Okay, me a bolt cutter, we love to break it.